Okay, we're going to get started with our next session. Um, my name is Laurel Gershwin, and I'm going to be uh, moderating this next session. Um, and our next session is Recent Developments in Host Response. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Donna Berry. Uh, Dr. Berry is going to be talking about genetics of BRD cattle, uh, asking the question, can breeding programs reduce the problem? Uh, Dr. Berry is a part-time beef and sheep farmer. Uh, he's also principal investigator in quantitative genetics at the Semi-State Research Center in Moore Park in Ireland. Uh, following his bachelor's degree uh, in the Agricultural uh, Semi-State uh, uh, Research Center in Moore Park, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the University of College, University College in Dublin in the year 2000. He undertook a PhD in dairy cattle genetics in collaboration with the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. He recently completed a part-time um, MSc in bioinformatics and systems biology at University College Cork, Ireland. He is responsible for research on genetics in dairy and beef cattle and has recently become involved in sheep and plant genetics. His main interests are in the derivation of breeding goals, genetic and genomic evaluations, statistics, decision support tools, and breeding programs. He has uh, well over 140 peer-reviewed publications. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Barry. Thanks, Okay, thank you. Um, I've been warned to speak very slowly, so that you can get my accent. But the good news as well is that I wrote my slides very slowly as well. So, uh, even though my talk is about BRD, what I'm going to spend a lot of my talk about is trying to convince you that genetics has actually something to deliver in health to health in general. And at the end, we'll focus more particularly then on BRD. So genetics to date, it, it contributes around half of the changes that we have seen in most well-structured breeding programs, irrespective of the species. And I've highlighted their change in, in green or in red because change does not always mean good things. So genetics is responsible for increasing milk production in dairy cows, growth rate in beef, but it's also a consequence, it's deteriorating reproductive performance. So it's due to all of this change. And a nice way of summarizing things, I think, is that genetics creates the potential, management realizes the potential, but disease destroys the potential. And I would also say that it's very easy to manage a genetically healthy cow to be unhealthy if you expose that animal to a high pathogen load. However, it can be very difficult or very expensive to manage a genetically unhealthy cow to be healthy because you have to essentially put the individual into a kind of a very clean environment. And a good example, I guess, is if anybody has kids, you know, when you go into the classroom, when a cold appears or when somebody has the flu, there's always one kid that gets it no matter what. But also there are kids who don't succumb to the disease, yet they're in the same environmental conditions, albeit a bit nutritional differences from at home. But a lot of that is actually due to genetic predisposition. The good thing about genetics is it's what we call cumulative and permanent. So you can build on it year on year. And if you introduce good genes in one year, they become better, or you introduce a better complement the year after, and so on. But the bad news about it being cumulative and permanent is that if you introduce bad genes, they can stay within your population for many years to come, and very difficult to get out of. And as arrogant as us statistical geneticists or animal breeders are, we're not arrogant enough to say that we can do this on our own. And we heard a lot about this earlier on is genetics is only part of an overall strategy to improve animal health and then from this conference perspective, susceptibility to BRD. So you might ask again, why, why genetics? And once we look at the, and discover if a disease has a genetic component, there's a lot of what we call genomics work you can do. And Alison is going to talk about this in the next slide. So what I'm particularly going to focus on is how can we use this information in a breeding program and at the very end, talk about preventative medicine strategies or pharmacogenetics. A lot of people call, talk about pharmacogenomics. So how does the genome of an individual affect its response to drugs? I call it pharmacogenetics because it's at a holistic 
generic level. Now, I give a lot of talks, both nationally and internationally, and everything I, I, I hear a lot about is genetics has nothing to do with disease. Um, it's all management. Breeding, even if it was genetically determined, it's too slow. We'll never make progress. And we, we can eradicate it through other means. I'm talking to vets. I gave a talk to vets once where I got absolutely no question. And one guy came up to me afterwards and he said, it's not that we're not interested, it's just that we know we can do nothing about it, which is totally untrue. But a lot of these comments to me are essentially just a broken record, and I'm going to show you why. And we just take a fertility lesson, or a history lesson, looking at fertility within the host and Frisian breed. And this is U.S. data. What I'm showing here is the decline in daughter pregnancy rate within the U.S. host and herd. So we can see that it is declining, and most people are well aware of this. But if we were to just superimpose on top of this, the genetic merit for these exactly same animals, we can see that it's tracking it. Or in other words, the phenotypic decline, or the decline we're seeing on farm, is tracking the genetic decline. Yet, around 10 years ago, physiologists tried to stop my PhD going ahead, which was on the genetics of fertility, because they said exactly what the last slide said. They said genetics has nothing to do with fertility. Yet, we can see that it quite does. This is an Irish control study where, as maiden heifers, we went out and we identified animals that were genetically almost identical for milk production genetic merit, but totally divergent for fertility. So we have fert positive animals and fert negative animals, so good fertility, low genetic merit for fertility. We brought them into a controlled environment, all managed exactly the same. What you can see is that their milk production was relatively similar, but the fertility, the genetic, the, the, the heifers that had favorable genetic merit for fertility far surpassed those that had negative genetic merit. Everybody had told us beforehand it was all management. Heritability of fertility is 3%, therefore 97% of it is management. They said genetics is irrelevant. But you can quite clearly show, I see here, that genetics has a large contribution to fertility. So if you were coming into this conference thinking genetics has nothing to do with health, Hopefully, I've now convinced you to at least open your mind to the potential that genetics can deliver to improving susceptible or resistance of individuals or tolerance of individuals to BRD and other health ailments. I just want to quickly talk a little technical term, probably called heritability. And I would argue that this is what probably the most misunderstood statistic in animal breeding. What the heritability is, is it's how much of the variation amongst a group of animals that are similarly managed, how much of that is due to their genetic differences? We can say BRD, we'll just skip ahead a few slides, we show that the heritability for BRD is around 10%. That does not mean that 90% of the variation is due to management. Because within that 90%, there's measurement error, there's recording errors, there's pedigree errors, and there's also other random variation there. Now, it's, it's an unwritten rule in my discipline of statistical genetics that you have to present at least one equation when you're giving a talk. So this is my equation for the day. And it is the most fundamentally important equation in animal breeding. What it says is that genetic gain is a function of the intensity of selection. So do we select the top 1% or the top 10%? It's a function of the accuracy of selection. If I put a group of calves into, the fee, into a pen, how accurately can I tell you that that animal is genetically better than that animal? Accuracy of selection is key. Genetic variation. If there's no genetic variation, we can't make genetic improvement. And then the denominator is what we call the generation interval, which is the average age of the parents when their progeny are born. So what drives accuracy? And this is where the heritability comes in. Heritability drives accuracy. But it can be actually overcome by using a lot more information. So just very quickly, just going to give you a quick synopsis of some heritability estimates for a plethora of different health traits. You notice I don't have BRD in here yet. But we have diseases like tuberculosis, yonis, mastitis, etc. Here is the heritability on the vertical axis. The red dots represent the mean estimates from a number of different studies I looked at. The standard error bars represent the lowest estimate and the highest estimate, respectively. So... In the generalization, what you can see is that the heritability for, 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 for health traits is lowish. It's around 5 to 
the heritability for most fertility traits is around 3%. So I showed you earlier the massive progress that we can make or even deterioration that we can make in fertility through genetics. So now I'm hopefully showing you that for other health traits, we can also actually make similar gains. So if we just move on to the genetics of BRD, and there's many papers, well, there's not many, there's, there's several papers on the genetics of BRD, and most of the good ones really come from the US. So I'm just going to quickly synopsize some of those experiments. If we look at US MARC, the research center in Clay Center, um, they had a multi-breed population consisting of around nine purebreds and three composites. The calves, they were monitored daily. I'm sure most people in the, in the room are probably familiar with these uh, ongoing study. Their phenotype was what they called treatment for observed BRD. Now, they use a scale of 100 to 200. 100, no BRD. 200, they were treated for BRD. For the purposes of this talk, I've just transformed that to be a binary scale, 0 or 1. It just... It'll, it'll be more obvious why I did that in a second. And they have around 20,000 records in that analysis. The other study came from Iowa, a very similar study. The phenotype was treatment of observed clinical BRD. Um, again, I transformed that to a binary scale. They also used number of BRD treatments, which, which I'm not going to talk about. And they had around 5,000 animals in their experiment. So if we look at the heritability estimates and there was several publications. I'm only concentrating on a few. They looked at very different combinations and permutations of, of, of data sets, different time periods, different breeds, etc. Looking across time periods, the heritability, the direct heritability varied from around 4 to 8 percent. So around 4 to 8 percent of the variability on whether or not an animal was treated for BRD was due to genetics that are transmitted from one generation to the next. Looking at it across different breed types, pretty similar, around 2 to 22% uh, direct heritability. The other concept which I didn't really talk about is what we call the maternal heritability. So that's the genetics of the cow herself, not those that are transmitted to her progeny. So mothering ability, etc., would be an indication of the maternal heritability. And we had some discussion the last session about looking at the cow and how the cow influences the actual genetic susceptibility or the susceptibility of the individual calf. That was from, from 0 to around 3% or 13%. In Iowa, it was around 7 to 11% heritable. So if we just look at all of these and just summarize them, what we're seeing from the US studies is that the direct heritability is around 11% and the maternal heritability is around 4%. So let me go back to our equation. But remember what I said is it's not all about heritability. So the number of legs that were born, which are the number of fingers that we have, that's probably around 100% heritable. But that doesn't mean that we can improve it, or we can er tomorrow change all of us to have six fingers or four fingers. It's also a function of the genetic variation. And if we look at the genetic standard deviation, and this is why I transformed it to a binary scale, it's around 8 percentage units. So quite considerable variation there amongst sires. And we'll come back to this one in a second. But again, Going back to the very start, you might have thought I was crazy talking about fertility in a BRD conference, but I hopefully I proved to you that we, we can change fertility through genetics, good or bad, we can change it. The genetic standard deviation for fertility traits for pregnancy rate is only around 5%. Yet we can see how fast we made fertility decline, and now how we're improving fertility, with just, under, just over half of the actual genetic variation, and quite considerably less heritability. Another study that was carried out in Norway, um, Norway is obviously one of the parts of the Scandinavian countries in Europe. They have a very, they, they would have the best health recording system in the world for a plethora of different diseases. So they had around a quarter of a million dairy calves, in, included in this, Norwegian red animals. They say that they're free from IBR and, and BVD. So in this data set, they had just less than 1% incidence. They showed a heritability of around 5% and a genetic standard deviation, good genetic standard deviation of around 20 percentage units. So if you break that down into their data, what they were showing was that some sires, the best sires, less than half, half a percentage of their calves succumbed to the disease, while in the worst sires, over 1 percent of their calves succumbed to the disease. If we look at it in Ireland, so we have a national uh, BVD eradication scheme which we've been operating compulsory since 2002. It was voluntary up until then. 
every single calf that's born, dairy or beef, is, has an ear biopsy taken for testing for antibody, antibodies to, to BVD. So I looked at this data. Obviously, when you work with animal health data, you need to ensure that every animal is equally exposed to the pathogen. So we put on a number of different criteria in here, only selecting cows that had calves born at a certain time period, so therefore more, were more likely to be exposed to the pathogen during the critical time of gestation. Ended up with over 80,000 calves. We have an incidence there of around 10%, so this is a highly edited data set, and it's not representative of, of Irish statistics, so don't go broadcasting it. In, in Ireland, it's actually less than 0.7% of units is our national incidence. Looking at the heritability statistics, 16% heritable direct with a genetic standard deviation of 8%. So very similar to what we're seeing in the US. Maternal heritability of around 5%. Remember I said in the US it's around 4%. A genetic standard deviation of 4 percentage units. So very, very consistent across the populations. We start talking about genetic standard deviations and people start switching off. What does a standard deviation mean? This is what it means. So when we look at sires in Ireland from this data set that have at least 50 progeny in at least 10 different herds, this is the mean BVD prevalence of their progeny. So we can see that some animals, only around 2% of their calves succumb to the disease, while one bull in particular, he was a limousine bull, 26% of his calves succumbed to the disease. Now you could say to me, ah, that's all because it was just in one particular farm and he, he just was riddled with BVD. This was bulls that had at least 50 progeny in at least 10 different herds. That bull had progeny, I think, across 13 different herds. So it wasn't just a manifestation of, or an artifact of one or two particular herds that were, had a lot of BVD. If we do a genetic evaluation, and we did that for these, and we plot the sire breeding value, so that's an estimate of the genetic merit of the bull, plot his breeding value against his mean prevalence. This is on, the vert on, on, on this graph on the, on the left, we can see this is the breeding value and this is the sire mean prevalence. You're seeing a very good relationship there, so that there is a strong genetic predisposition to susceptibility to BRD. Look at the maternal grandsire versus grand project. This to pick up that maternal heritability component that I talked about. Again, a relatively strong relationship there. But what I would say is, what if a priori, when they were only one or two weeks of age, and Alison is going to talk about the potential of genomic evaluations to do this, what if we were to say to the AI station, hey, don't use those bulls. They have a bad genetic merit for BVD. You won't be getting any bulls then that have greater than around 17% prevalence. So you can reduce the incidence by not using those particular bulls in your breeding scheme. If we just look at, look at um, bovine herpavirus, or what we call IBR, we have a very small data set in Ireland. It wasn't particularly set up for this, but again, if you know any quantitative geneticists, you know that for parasites, any bit of data, we'll take it and analyze it. We don't really know what we're analyzing, but we'll just analyze it anyway. Don't anybody ask me what any of these things are. I won GE and GB, but I know this is for when the herd is vaccinated, this is not when the herd is vaccinated. Heritability statistics of around 3% to 34%. Again, this is pretty consistent with everything that I've shown earlier on from all the other populations around the world. And again, the key one is your genetic standard deviation. Lots of variation there that we can exploit. So you might ask, even though I've shown some consistency, why are these heritability statistics varying across populations? And I know I said we're only supposed to present one slide on a mathematical equation, but I know I'm talking to intellects here, so I said I'll give you two slides. This is the formulation or the mathematical formulation of heritability. We denote it as H with a square, just to confuse everybody. So what, how much of the phenotypic variation, so that's the variation in a field of, or in a pen of cattle, how much of that is due to their genetics. So if we look at the numerator, what drives genetic variation? If you went into a, a pen of cloned animals, there's no genetic variation there. They're all genetically identical. They all have the same what we call allele frequency and they're not segregation in the population. So the DNA is exactly the same. So if you had a, a pen of Charles and a pen of Zebu, there's lots of genetic variation inside there. 
the allele substitution effect, what is the, the impact of these particular DNA variants? And Alison is probably going to talk about this as well. And the mode of gene action, do they interact with each other? That will all influence our genetic variation. And genetic variation can change with time due to evolutionary forces. So when you inbreed, you reduce your genetic variation within that population, all else being equal. When you imply selection, you actually reduce the allele frequency of the, the unfavorable alleles. And also a sort of mating by mating animals that are, are to generate um, favorable characteristics. If we look at the denominator then, the residual variation, this is due to environmental effects like pathogen load, it's due to some of our problems, statistical modeling. So I can increase or decrease the heritability of a trait very, very easily. Exactly the same data set. If I make a rubbish model, my heritability is going to go down. So remember, when people were talking about with heritability, they said 3% heritable, therefore 97% management. I would say that 97% also includes the inadequacies or the incompetence of quantitative geneticists to model that data correctly. And we all know, we've heard this already today about the complexity of BRD. So there's also errors in the data. I'm not sure, well, I do know what your statistics are in, in the US. It's around 15% of the pedigree of the parentage of your calves is actually incorrect. In New Zealand, I'd say it's around 30%. In Ireland, our recent estimate in the good farmers is 8.5%. That all contributes to residual error. So what are the implications? Well, if we just look at what we're trying to do is really what we're trying to do is go into a pen of, of cattle and say, that is the genetically best animal or that's the genetically worst animal. Or more importantly, if we're selecting bulls for AI, we can say that's the best animal, that's the worst animal. So it's all about accuracy. What I've shown here in the vertical axis is how does the accuracy change as the number of progeny of the bull will say that increase. As you would expect, as the number of progeny increase, the accuracy increases. But it increases at a different rate depending on the heritability. So the red line is for mastitis. It's around 3% heritable. You can see it takes a lot more progeny to get high accuracy of selection. But BRD, it, it, it gets this, uh, the higher accuracy faster, and for milk yield or growth rate, it's faster again. So essentially, what it means is that, forget about heritability, just get lots of progeny, or do what Alison is talking about, and get some genomic information in there, and get yourself up this curve as fast as possible. The big question is, what are the gains that are achievable? And in order for a trait to be included in a breeding goal, it needs to have three precursors. It needs to be important, it needs to exhibit genetic variation, and it needs to be measurable, either in the field or with genomics. Luckily enough, BRD ticks all of those three marks. So we move on to stage two. What are the gains that can be achievable? It all depends on what else is in the breeding objective, what else is in our goal. So, and how accurately can we actually define that's the best animal relative to that animal? And what is the economic importance of BRD? Luckily enough for BRD, we know, because I just showed you, how the accuracy of selection increases as our uh, progeny group size increase. And I don't know, but I'm sure there are people in the audience that can tell me the economic cost of BRD. All we need to know, therefore, is how does BRD relate to genetics for growth rate in beef cattle for milk yield in dairy cattle? And this is just some work from, from Clay Center showing the genetic correlations between BRD and a number of different important traits in beef. They're all relatively close to zero. The problem is, is that the data set was relatively small, so the standard errors or the degree of confidence was not really there for those correlations. That we can unequivocally say, yep, yeah, it's not correlated with growth rate or with, with fat or whatever. Look at another data set again. Correlations are, does the Iowa data set, a lot of them are relatively weak, some exceptions, but again, the standard errors are really too large for us to say whether or not it's correlated with these important traits. So my conclusion is we don't really know. So the best way when you don't know something is to simulate it. So what I've done is I've simulated, pretending that there's two traits, and we assume an annual genetic gain of around 0.22 genetic standard deviations, which is normal in a well-structured breeding program. We take BRD, has a heritability of 16%, genetic standard deviation of 0 0.08. We just call this a terminal trait. Let's pretend it's carcass weight or growth rate. Heritability of 3%, and let's just give it the same genetic standard deviation just for simplicity purposes. What I've done is I've looked at sensitivity of number of progeny records, how important is this terminal trait relative to BRD, and also this genetic correlation. 
if we select for growth rate, are we increasing or reducing susceptibility to BRD? So here's the genetic change expected in BRD. Here's the genetic correlation with the terminal trait. Just remember here, negative is good if we're talking about growth rate. So increased growth rate will give us reduced susceptibility. What I'm showing here is, and this is for if we have infinite information on BRD, so if, if Allison's talk proves 100% accurate that we can get with genomic markers, I can tell you with 100% confidence that that's a good animal versus that's a bad animal. What you can see is you would expect if the correlation is favorable point, minus 0.5 with terminal traits, you expect BRD annually to reduce the incidence to reduce by 1.5 percentage units. Probably not going to happen. Correlation is Let's just say, looking at the other data set, it was around zero. The expected incidence will reduce around 1.2 percentage units. But you, as you can see, as the correlation increases, so it becomes antagonistic, you can see that the rate of gain in BRD susceptibility reduces. That's where you have equal emphasis. If you don't have, so if Allison is not successful in getting really good genomic predictions, and if I can only produce 100 progeny per bull, your accuracy of genetic evaluations reduce, and therefore your response to selection reduces. But what happens, and this is probably more likely a scenario using back of the envelope calculations, what happens if the terminal trait is 10 times more important than the BRD trait? And let's just assume, based on the recent evidence, there is no correlation between them. That means really we're going to make no genetic progress in BRD. So even though the economic value of BRD might be such and such. We heard earlier about McDonald's potentially saying, we're not going to accept any of these vaccination protocols. We might have to artificially inflate the relative importance of BRD and bring it down to this level here where we can actually increase BRD or increase resistance to BRD. What happens to the terminal traits, of course, is a big question. Well, when you have equal emphasis, or a heavy, when you have a lot more emphasis on the terminal traits, not much happens to, BRD, or to genetic gain in, in the terminal traits. But when the emphasis is the same, and when the correlation is unfavorable, you're going to suffer genetic gain in growth rate. So just to finish off, um, come back to the earlier slide, I just talked about the breeding program. Now what I just quickly want to talk about is preventative medicine or pharmacogenetics. So if you were faced with these two calves, which one is more likely to succumb to BRD? And you're probably going to say it's the one on the left. And just to, because to, you like taking bloods, I know there's a lot of vets in the audience, you'd love to take bloods, you're going to take a blood samples and do some antibiotic testing, and that'll tell you. But now, which one of those cows is going to succumb to BRD? And that's the real difficulty. So what I'm telling you is that potentially genetics can help us as a, a very early diagnostic test to, is this animal high risk or low risk? And remember, there's a talk, at the, I think, at the very start about the sale of these calves as high risk or low risk. Potentially in the future, you could see this coming up on the screen saying this is a high risk, genetically high risk of BRD, genetically low risk of BRD, and you can be preyed appropriately. So we can look at this DNA. I work a lot on statistical genetics, and Alison works a lot on using the DNA information, but it's, it's irrelevant which one of us is going to actually succeed if, if we can have a tool that will actually derive that that animal is genetically more predisposed to BRD. And you might say that's rubbish, you'll never be able to do it. Look at breast cancer or cancer as an example in BRCA1 and BRCA2. There are two genes where their mutations predisposes the female and the male to greater risk of breast cancer and the female ovarian cancer. If you screen yourself for those tests, what you can do is you can then do an enhanced screening. So go for more regular testing to the doctor, prophylactic treatment, a mastectomy or something like that, and more management or chemo prevention, greater vitamins or greater nutrition. It's the same in cattle. We can actually, in the future, be able to do something similar. Looking at diagnostics, I'm sure you've, you've, you're well used of all of these types of things, these two by two contingency tables. You can get true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives things that I've never even heard of before. What I'm going to talk about is the true positives versus the false positive. I'm just going to finish off with this one. Again, earlier we heard a bit of this rock curve analysis, receiver operating characteristic curves, where it just looks at the sensitivity versus, versus uh, a function of the specificity. 
for a, um, a, a, a test. So it allows you then to pick a particular threshold that will give you a desired sensitivity versus, versus specificity. However, the area under this curve, so the area here is, a, is what we call the area under the curve is a very useful statistic. Where, while here, the area of the curve is 0.5, it's just like flipping a coin whether or not that animal is going to succumb to BRD. But what the area under the curve tells us is what's the probability that a particular classifier, so in my example is genetic merit, if we were to randomly pick a, a, an animal that has succumbed to the disease, what's the probability that it would rank higher for genetic merit? Those of you that are familiar with statistics, it's similar to the Man Whitley or the, the Wilcoxon test. So what it shows is here's the area under the curve for different prevalences. And I'm just showing a, a, a trait with a heritability of just 1%, very lowly heritable. What it shows is it's better than flipping a coin. But when the prevalence is very low, it's especially good. But what if the heritability differed? And generally they say well, an area under the curve of 0.75 is pretty good for diagnostics. So that's around here. I showed you that the heritability for BRD is around 15 to 20%. So what are we? We're around here. Which, the prevalence you showed earlier, I think, was around 12%. So we're around here. The area under the curve that we're getting for this genetic test, assume that we can explain all the genetic variation, is an area under the curve of around 0.73. Not taking cognizance of anything else, like the age of the animal, how many movements it's had, etc. Just purely based on the genetic potential, we can get an area under the curve for BRD of around 0.73. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's more to life in animal breeding than, or to, more to genetics than just animal breeding. We can also use it for diagnostic purposes. So therefore, to conclude, um, hopefully I've convinced you that genetics and animal breeding actually has something to deliver for animal health and for, for BRD. Everybody says breeding is slow, but again, I'm... I'm only in genetics 14 years, and we have seen the demise of fertility in the Holstein region in that 14 years now starting to improve. So that was all due to breeding, predominantly. So it, we can change it very, very quickly. However, we need information, be it phenotypic field data or genomic information. And my last slide was that genetic, estimates of genetic merit has other uses other than for breeding. Thank you. <laughs>